Hello everyone, this is Take from BigHeadTalk.com and welcome to my big echoey and empty studio. This is going to be the future home of all of my, I shouldn't say future because here we go, this is my first video here in my new studio space. Um, it's going to be echoey because there's no furniture in here yet other than the desk and the chair that I'm sitting on right now. I'm in a hurry to review this camera, this beautiful Nikon 28Ti that I've had on loan from the darkroom. So thank you so much, Philip, and thank you so much, Trev. I've had it since September. I've shot in San Clemente. I've shot in Osaka, in Kyoto, and then I took it with me to Hong Kong and then back to Vancouver. So I've had a really good kind of a long-term test uh, using this camera. Well, let's uh, get into my review very quickly. But before I do that, uh, just so you know, I'll be basically comparing it in terms of my experience of shooting with point shoots, my Ricoh, my venerable Ricoh GR1 that I bought brand new in 1998. I've had this for a long time, and when I bought this brand new for, you know, it was maybe six or 700 US, this was like $1,400 US, so this was double the price of this. And that's the reason why I bought this, because I, I couldn't really afford this, but I've always wanted this camera. Uh, a lot of it is because of that, this really unique uh, camera dial type analog dial system, which was actually uh, built and designed for them by Seiko, the watch company. And uh, this is the primary reason why, I mean, you guys know I, I, I love mechanical watches. And so uh, that, as well as the fact that this is a titanium body, and this is a, sort of a magnesium alloy body, it's almost twice the weight. And uh, the one thing I'll say very quickly is the Ricoh Gear 1, definitely the lens is sharper, but this has less distortion and less light fall off. But let's begin the review now. The 28 Ti came after the, the 35 Ti, and the 35 Ti actually did come in the titanium color, that silvery gray kind of color, and the following year, so this came out in, uh, I think 1994 or 95, around there. So the 35 Ti came out in, in 93. Um, and the, aesthetically, it, it is pretty much identical. The, the biggest thing you'll notice in terms of aesthetics as well as function, other than the color, is of this, this little toggle for the flash. The 35 Ti has buttons. This has like a little slider switch, and we'll talk about that and why this is a, a big bonus of why, uh, not only because of the focal length, I prefer 28, but why I would probably never buy the 35 for me personally. Okay, so uh, this is a 28 millimeter f2.8 uh, prime lens, seven elements in five groups, and it does have, it is multi-coated and it has uh, the the extra low dispersion type glass in there. So it's it's a really well balanced lens. It is as good as any kind of a prime lens that would have come in the Nikon F mount, better than probably most zoom lenses, especially of that time of 1994. Like today we accept the fact that these little point shoots were as sharp and as good as their SLR counterparts. And at that time people did not accept that a compact point shoot could have as good of a quality image as a full size camera. And these were sort of the first ones, the Contax T series and the Nikon, the TI series that really started challenging uh, that sort of that notion that if you ask the average person, could this shoot as well as an SLR, the average public would have said, no, there's no way. Something that small couldn't shoot that way, but this definitely could. And it came down to this lens. But another thing this had was that matrix metering. And I was just blown away at how accurate uh, this was, especially when you use fill flash. And I'll, you know, I'll embed pictures uh, throughout the video. And so uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, you load the film on this side. Uh, there are, yeah, you load the film on this side, goes that way. So the film is upside down. I don't think that makes a difference to anyone. The Ricoh GR also loads on from the right. And this is the Yashica T4. It opens up on the right hand side as well. And that's very common for these point shoots to, to open this way. I'm not gonna do a concise feature by feature review of this. Uh, Mike Padua has a really great, I'll link it down below, as a great overview video of the 35 Ti. And he pretty much, other than the flash, pretty much everything else is is the same. So I'm gonna just basically go over pros and cons that I found while I shot with this is number one, the metering. 
is dead on. Uh, and that's kind of what I was mentioning. I wouldn't buy the 35 Ti. You have to press the flash, force flash button to make sure that the flash goes off. But if you're shooting with one hand or you're holding an umbrella, you can't do that unless you change the custom function. And same with uh, suppress flash, flash off. Here is basically force flash on, um, force flash off, or auto in the middle, right? And that's perfect. And just for that feature alone, that's why I would choose the 28 over the 35 because I actually do use a lot of fill flash in point and shoots. These things all have leaf shutters. It's easy to use flash during the day for nice fill, but a lot of point and shoots, they tend to wash out the exposure. And with the matrix metering here, which is it actually meters during the exposure because if the lighting condition changes mid exposure, most cameras, it can't adjust for it after, right? Uh, this one here can adjust in the middle of exposure. So it pre-meters, you shoot it, and during that split second, the lighting changes, the camera can actually adjust for that. And that's why you get fantastic fill flash with this. It even compared to an SLR camera of that time, and even a DSLR of today, I have not seen a camera balance fill flash auto so perfectly uh, than this camera here. It's just beautiful. And that's the number one reason why I would use this. In a lot of my pictures that I shot, uh, I used a lot of fill flash. Here is a picture here of uh, Ekben Chia there in Hong Kong. This is Silbera Pan 200 film. Another fill flash picture of Anson of the uh, shutter lines, and that's fill flash during the day, and that's another still bear pan. And here is picture of Olivia Lala Lam, another fill flash picture. So fill flash with this camera is, is fantastic. Um, you have aperture control um, here. So if you go into, so you're in, you're in P mode here, so that's pro, pro program mode, you can see that. And then as soon as you go into aperture priority, you just have to change this aperture dial here, and you can choose your aperture accordingly. And down below there, there's an exposure compensation dial, but you have to press the plus and minus button here. So if you press this, it's gonna be a lot harder to see and I don't even know if the, this will work. If not, I'll do an insert, but that's how you adjust it. And even with the camera turned off, you can see that you are slightly over and under exposing. That's the beauty of this. When you autofocus this camera, so let's just kind of show you when you autofocus. There you go. And for a few seconds, the, the, it shows you the distance that it's at. And that's a, the reason why it pauses there is because when you're looking through here, you can't see the distance. So you have pre-focus, and then you look up and you can see what the camera's focused on. Now these cameras, they use a type of focusing that was based mostly on distance. It wasn't contrast detect. And so right now, if I shoot against, against the window, it will actually just pick It'll hit the window and it's focusing on the window, not through the window. And so most of these have this infinity mode. So if you're shooting through windows with these little point and shoots and there's a little mountain there, that's infinity mode, go into infinity mode or else you can't shoot through windows. But another thing is if you're doing street cell photography, first of all, this is noisy. But as well, that's very slow to focus. And so what you would do is, let's say you pre-focus the distance, you're trying to shoot things that are moving, you pre-focus, and then you look and it's like, oh, it's this distance. Then what you do is you press the, uh, the AF mode and you can turn this. And as you can see, now it's adjusting the distance. And you can move it to that distance and now it'll stay at that distance. You shoot. And if you're, cause you're in auto, your manual focus mode, it'll always stay there. So this is basically your, your zone focusing, right? Scale focusing. But the fact that you can first auto focus the distance and then after that, you can pre-focus to that distance. And now there's no, I mean, it still has to move out into that position. And I wish it didn't do that. So you still have to press halfway and then press the button. And then now you've got your shot. And so street photography, can you shoot with this? Yes, but you need to know at what distance you're working at. And so for me, if you shoot with a manual focus camera, you know, you know, whatever focal length you're shooting, you, you tend to know that you shoot at, at six feet or eight feet or you know 1.5 meters, two meters, whatever distance you're working at. So that's another thing I really like about this. You get to actually see the focus distance that the camera's choosing, which a lot of these other cameras, you can't do that. You can see the shutters. Now you can't control shutter speed with this, but you can see the shutter speed in here so you know if it's hand holdable or not. 
Um, you can change you can change this to see the aperture as well in here, but that's one of the custom functions uh, in this camera. But I, I would recommend to leave it in the shutter speed mode. Cons. This, as I mentioned before, is almost twice the weight of this camera here. And I wish that this camera here has has the has the, the 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 double the double lugs here, so you can actually put this around your neck vertically like this. Uh, this one here has the only the single strap lug. I wish it had a second one here, or if they had them both here, because this is heavy enough that I would actually carry this around my neck, and uh, I would carry this around my neck. And I wish it had the double lugs. Uh, number two, it is a very noisy on. Right, and a noisy, it's very, it's overall, it's a very noisy camera. It's not like what we're used to with today's uh, digital cameras. And so you have to put up with that. And even the winding and rewinding is very noisy. No exposure lock. Uh, you cannot half press, you can half press and lock the focus, but you cannot half press and lock the exposure. And the thinking of Nikon's probably because it is that 3D matrix metering that as I mentioned, it, it changes exposure on the fly even during exposure. And so between focus and exposure, this will miss focus more often than mess up the exposure, which is something that's probably the opposite of today's modern digital cameras where usually focus is spot on, but the exposure is off. This thing here is I've, I've never had a missed exposure. And the final thing that's kind of a newer thing, this is DX coded, so you put in film, it can read the speed. If it's not DX coded, it defaults to probably 100, um, is that you cannot push or pull. So if you throw in Tri-X and you wanna shoot at ISO 1600 or 800, you cannot do that unless you do one of two things. One is you override it with a your own, uh, you can cut out a piece of tin foil aluminum and and actually color in the proper DX coding. And there's YouTube videos for that that you can look up yourself. Or you'll have to put in ISO 400 film, right? And then if you wanna push it to 1600, you know that's two stops. So it's from 400 to 800, it's two stops. So you can use the exposure compensation and push it two stops. What you do is you underexpose by two stops. And so that's kind of a workaround, but it's not a great workaround. And so uh, I think the, the Minolta TC1, uh, which is probably the next camera, Philip, I hope you don't give that away before I test it. But if that one, I'm almost positive has a uh, manual ISO override, which most SLRs that were geared towards serious amateurs and pros had that. Uh, this unfortunately does not have that. That's, those are the real only cons and uh, everything else, uh, If it, in terms of the weight, it's kind of, I think the Nikon, uh, well 35 Ti were the same weight. I think the T2s and all those other cameras were of similar weight. The Minolta TC1 is smaller and lighter. The Ricoh GR1 is is much thinner and definitely much lighter. Uh, in terms of size, the Yashica T4 is probably slightly smaller, but it is a plastic body, so it is going to be lighter as well. But uh, overall, I think this is a fantastic camera, and, and I am and I'm I, I'm loath to to return it. One more con I, I forgot to mention, but it's kind of a con of its time, is that there is I think seven or eight custom function modes and it's very, very cryptic. And if you watch Mike Padua's video, he'll, he, you know what, maybe I'll give a link to it as well. Uh, it's the 35 Ti's custom function, so there's I think seven or eight. And it's a combination of using the mode and the set button while turning it on. Um, it's like 010002 is this feature, 020002 is this feature. It's very cryptic. And I think if it's your camera and you learn what you wanna turn on and off, uh, one of the things I mentioned, you can see shutter speed in here instead of aperture. You can change the flash for setting, but I think that's only for the 35 Ti. But there are little, um, there's also a, a gauge cluster reset. So sometimes what happens, it never happened with me, but the gauge cluster actually goes off a little bit and it's not perfectly lined up. And if that happens, there is a reset where it resets all the gauges back to zero and uh, in case it gets knocked out of place for some odd reason. I, I, I didn't use, I didn't change any of the custom features. Um, I didn't use the T mode, which to me it's really silly because if it has a T mode for timer, I wish it had a threaded shutter release so you can actually 
just press it like this instead of having to keep your finger on the camera. So I thought that's kind of silly. And a camera like this, I don't know how many people actually use the T mode. I think it would have been better as a shutter priority mode instead and then have uh, shutter speeds on the inside of the aperture. But again, these are all unnecessary points because this camera is now discontinued. And I wish Nikon uh, had their, the, the Coolpix A, which was kind of competing with the digital Ricoh GR, uh, should have been an homage to this camera and it really didn't do it any justice. And uh, this is a classic. The, the anodization on this, I've never seen a bad shape 28 ti first of all because they were very expensive and as well uh probably wasn't used that often and they're probably treated sort of like like a jewel right and because of that uh they probably weren't scuffed up too much i have the original uh nikon leather case for it it's in great shape as well and in one of my videos when i was in hong kong i actually did have this on my hip like a soccer dad but uh when you're shooting uh, constantly with it made the most sense to have it on my hip um, but the, the finish on this is beautiful and so this is going back to the darkroom so thank you again Philip uh, for loaning me this camera and this will go into their camera bar and they have their monthly competitions and they have you know first prize second prize third prize and uh, you get a chance to win this you get a chance to win the same camera that I shot all these cool pictures with all over the world and so I asked Philip if I was allowed to enter the contest and he said no and so too bad I'm not allowed to win this back and on here I do have this is not the stock strap this is a YD Putro strap I'm taking this off and then sending it back with the original strap but uh, beautiful camera for me people are going crazy over the contacts T2 this is a much prettier camera I think the focal length is appropriate for a point and shoot at 28 millimeter wide, but if not, then get the 35 Ti. Other than not being able to override the ISO, uh, I think this is a, it's cheaper than the, the T2, and I think it's a, it's better built, and I think it's a nicer camera overall. The metering on this is, is probably the best metering I've ever seen on any compact point shoot. So thank you so much for watching this supposedly quick review, but it hasn't turned out to be so quick. And again, you will watch the transformation of my studio here over time, and it'll be filled up with more things, but for now it's quite empty, hence the echo. So thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you soon. Happy shooting.